Uh, well, let's, let's pray first. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, thank you for our group and thank you that we are here together and, and that we're, we're learning about you and learning to worship you and learning to trust you. And I hope that, uh, I pray that, that each one of these men on this group is, um, is learning more to focus on you. And we just thank you that you sent your son Jesus to save us from eternal, eternal damnation and gave us eternity, eternity with you. And uh, again, we just continue to thank you for all that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. The, uh, we're we're, we're, we're going to say something? Somebody can say anything? All right. We're, I, if you remember, we're covering, uh, I think it's Monday to Sunday. So we will get to a today's reading and tomorrow's reading and kind of getting ahead on those but we're going to start with what we had monday which was in second samuel 18 verses 1 to 15 and this was where uh, uh david's son absalom had sort of usurped the crown decided he was going to be king and david didn't do a whole lot to uh, to object to that but I think it was his prophet Nathan and uh, and uh, Solomon's mother Bathsheba that came in and kind of reminded him that he had anointed Solomon or decided that Solomon was going to be king so he had his men rise up and go out and deal with Absalom and told him on the way to uh, deal gently get here and oh what happened I didn't push that button uh, to deal gently for his sake with Absalom. So they went to battle his people in the battle against Israel, which Israel was Absalom. Israel was following Absalom. And uh, David's men overthrew him. And if you remember, uh, Absalom was described somewhere as having this real big, thick head of hair, long hair. And he rode under a tree and got his tree caught in the, or his hair caught in a tree and was the mule kept going on hanging there from a tree and uh, somebody told Absalom or told jo Joab about it. Even after Joab had been told to deal uh, gently, he took three spears and went out and stabbed him in the heart. And um, then uh, his men went out and killed him again. I don't know why they had to kill him after he'd been stabbed in the heart three times. But um, yeah, I sort of went through what, what that was if y'all want to talk about that we've got that that we can talk about the the battle the rebellion was going on in what they call the forest of Ephraim and I'm not sure why the forest of Ephraim was way over here in Gilead when when Ephraim's over here on the other side of the Jordan but that's where the only place I could find that identified where that was so we just said David told his people that were going out to fight to deal with Absalom gently for David's sake and that Joab didn't do that he killed him and later on um, Joab has to pay the price David didn't kill him himself didn't execute him himself for being so disobedient because Joab was Joab was probably one of David's uh, most loyal commanders and he was certainly not going to, I don't think he was going to kill one of his loyal people. But he did task that to Solomon. And if you can, if you, we did eventually read into this section later on. I think that might have been maybe yesterday's reading or somewhere around in there, maybe the day before. In Second King, in First Kings chapter 2, uh, Joab ran to the altar was seeking, what do they call that? Not refuge, but um, sanctuary. Seeking sanctuary, grabbing onto the horns of the altar. And David had him executed anyway. Or excuse me, Solomon did. Um, sounds kind of harsh. There's a lot of harsh things went on in the Old Testament. Any, anybody want to talk about that any? Table's open. I just, I just thought there was a lot, a lot of killing. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know if it was, 
trust issues or I don't know. It just Joe Joe I have kind of kind of walked both sides of the fence, I guess, you know. He kind of yeah, took things, he did. kind of took things into his own hands even after being told, you know, like you said, deal gently and well, I don't David know. David was certainly uh I mean, he wasn't a a peacenik at all. He was described, and we talk about that later, as being a, a man of battle, a man of war. Um, and he dealt harshly with his enemies. Uh, it seemed like he let he let uh, his his own guys, even his sons, do things that were against the against the Judaic law and uh, weren't nice. I mean, he was he had a lot of people that were. I guess we call them sinful in our judgment times. Anybody else want to talk about that? So we'll go on to Tuesday. Um, we, re, David is uh, singing his uh, final song, sort of his summary of uh, being delivered from the hand of his enemies and the hand of Saul and what God meant to him during that time. He was his rock, his fortress, deliverer, shield, stronghold, refuge, savior. He's worthy to be praised. And in his distress, he called upon the Lord. And he heard his voice. Um, and what stands out to you guys in that? Anything, uh, anything that, that jumps out at anybody else? Um, it's, I mean, is that some sort of allusion to Peter, maybe? I mean, allusion to Peter. Better. Like he's, uh, you know, the rock, the rock. The... Well, um, if, if you look at a, a, a real deep discussion of what that, what that passage was, uh, in the New Testament, um, we actually went to the place where that message was delivered, and it was kind of interesting. Uh, he said that, uh, that, that Jesus said that uh, he's going to build his church on this rock, and that um, the words used were a little bit different for the way he described Peter the rock and the church the rock. Uh, the, church, the, the, the Greek terms used there were more related to the church that, that uh, the rock that the church was going to be built on was 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 Jesus, and that the word for Peter was like a sliver off the rock, a piece of gravel, uh, not not the bedrock or the the main rock. And the place where they had delivered that message, he said that the gates of hell wouldn't uh, stand against his church, and that was actually the Greek uh, mythology was the gates of hell where they were at Caesarea Philippi. Uh, they had a temple to uh, whatever the god of the underworld was. I, I can't remember which which it was, but there was a, there were two temples. The big one to Zeus. They always built big temples to Zeus, but uh, the smaller temple inside was to the the god of the underworld. And, and there was actually a cave that when they did sacrifices there, they would throw. I mean, human sacrifices and. I guess they did animal sacrifices too, but the the actual creek, or they call them rivers over there. They're like creeks in our terms. It is a desert, but it's kind of a spring uh, that they would throw the sacrifice into the upper opening of the cave, which was a big opening. It was probably 40, 50 feet uh, high and 30, 40 feet wide. It was taller than it was wide, but it was a great big cave opening. And they would throw the sacrifice into that opening. And if it came back out uh, in the spring, then the gods rejected that sacrifice. And oftentimes that was human sacrifice. But if they didn't come back out, then the god accepted the sacrifice. And they had to keep throwing sacrifices into that hole until nothing came out. Uh, so you wouldn't want to be... Uh, somebody that would be in line for a sacrifice in those times, but that was the kind of uh, gates of hell that Jesus was talking about. Um, but yes, and in, in back to the question about that particular passage, not necessarily Peter, but the same rock 
the rock that he's built his church on was was Jesus. And the, the Lord is the rock. And, and in Trinitarian um, uh, beliefs, you know, we believe that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all God. And so that would apply to God in general. And Jesus is God. So in answer to that part of the question, yes. I have a really different view of what, I mean, I don't have a different view. Catholics and Protestants have a different view of what uh, the rock was there. And it, I think, um, I, I don't want to raise a whole lot of controversy, but uh, the words were different in Greek. Anybody else? <coughs> All right, go on to Wednesday. We went through the list of the mighty men of David, and I, I had a hard time answering these. Um, got all those names in there, and I didn't see anything to highlight. Uh, there was a story that Corey liked. If you watched the, the uh, Bible Discovery TV program, Corey liked this thing about the guy defending these lentils just because she likes lentils, but that was just kind of a little <laughs> weird story along the way. Um, but anyway, this is a painting of uh, somebody's interpretation of the mighty man, David's mighty men. Um, but uh, anybody have any thoughts on why that might have been recorded? And what was the purpose? Well, aren't you giving us the answers right there on screen? That's the first time I, those, those, you notice they have question marks on them. <laughs> That's just what, the only thing I could come up with. Well, you know, you know, a person is only as good as the people they surround themselves with. <laughs> well, that's true. You know, to some extent, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, we still, we see that in what we do. Right. To, to lead, you know, to be the leader. I mean, a leader doesn't succeed in their own. And they're obviously, you know, the, I don't know, do we still call them the Israelites? What do we call them? I mean, the tribes of Israel, they, I mean, they were still well, surrounded and, yeah, by I mean, Any of them work. I mean, and if, so far in our reading, we're, we're talking about a united kingdom uh, so far. We'll get into the divided kingdom this week coming up, I think. But, you know, they were still surrounded by enemies. You, yeah. You still, you still were fighting over lands and, and uh, you know, the spoils of, of the lands and property and the right to exist just like it is today and that has never changed <laughs> well you know an interesting thing that were related to that is that once these mighty men were gone that kingdom split so you know i guess it's possible the mighty men kept the kingdom helped keep the kingdom together from the physical standpoint uh they were all you know it's not like these guys were privates and corporals these guys were colonels and generals they were the guys that were the leaders and they had been i think with david from the beginning if you remember the way they were described when david first was running from saul they were uh i can't remember the exact language they used but they were people that were in debt and were disgruntled and basically were the rejects of society uh, that followed david mm -hmm. and they, they certainly weren't a, uh, I guess they weren't in the bloodline to any kind of royalty. I don't think they were, David's mighty men were just guys that he picked up along the way. They were, they were gangsters. They were MS-13 like. They were, they were like the Memphis Mafia for Elvis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the last question here is why was David known as the king of battle? And yeah, I probably shouldn't have put that question mark on there because he won all the battles he was in. He very seldom ever lost a battle, and he he rid he rid Israel of the Philistines, and um, he was a pretty bad dude as far as everybody else was concerned. And that's why he wasn't allowed to build the the temple because he was a man of blood, uh, is what God told him that they waited for Solomon to have peace so that the temple could be built. And uh, so, you know, David, I guess, did have that against him, even though he was a man after God's own heart. All right, now. 
Uh, Let's go. Okay, we're getting ready to go into First Kings. Back to our timeline. Uh, we just finished Second Samuel. We're over to 850 BC. Get ready to start in the First Kings, which will go to 600 BC, and then we'll, and Second Kings, and then we'll jump back after we get to get done with Kings. Uh, so right now we're in. We're probably in this area right here. Solomon reigned, I think, for 40 years. Um, so if we go from uh, First Kings when Solomon was just taking over, uh, if if we say that was 850, we'll go up close to 800 BC in in First Kings. Oh, excuse me. In this week, and by the time Solomon is gone, which I think is about the end of First Kings. Um, and this is uh, Monday, is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday's reading. Um, this was talking about where Solomon uh, was finishing his house. He, he spent 14 years building his house and seven years building the temple. There's some discussion uh, that, that wonders why he spent twice as much time on his house as he did the temple. And part of it is, you know, one side of it <laughs> is that... Uh, he was selfish about his own house and wanted his own house to look better than the temple. But then there's another side of that that says that he wanted to get the temple finished first. He put more priority on the temple than he did his own house and finished the temple and then wasn't as, as eager <laughs> to finish his own house. So, you know, we don't know about that. But he, uh, I mean, that's not biblical. That's just discussion among the rabbis. Yeah. <laughs> He had all those but, leftover materials too, Jim, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, uh, but anyway, he, before they got the temple done, people were sacrificing at these high places, which God told them not to do uh, before they came in. They were sacrificing the same altars that the pagans had. Um, and so it was kind of an important thing to get the temple built. And Solomon followed the statutes of David, uh, except that he sacrificed and burned incense to these high places. Um, he went to went to Gibeon, uh, which was the main high place. Remember, the Gibeonites were the ones that came in and tricked the Israelites when they came into uh, the Promised Land and made a made a truce with uh, made a truce with them. Um, said they were from far away when they actually were from just from just down the road. And God had told them to cleanse the land, and they ended up taking these people in to be slaves. That they were um, ended up being slaves at the temple, I think. Anyway, uh, God came to Solomon in a dream at night, asking him what should he give him. And uh, Solomon said he wanted an understanding heart to judge your people, that he could discern between good and evil. Basically, he asked for wisdom. And so God decided to make him the wisest man in the world and told him if he walked in his ways and kept his statutes and his commandments as his father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Now, if you watch the Bible Discovery TV, you'll hear a comment that he only lived about 60 years uh, at a time when people were living a lot longer than that, particularly royalty, uh, and he only lived about 60 years, and that's probably because he had so many women. Um, I mean, the guy had 700 wives and 300 concubines, so he's dealing with a thousand women. Um, Blaming them and, women, I just... and that, That's got to give you a lot of heartache. <laughs> I mean, aside from what it can do to you physically, um, that seemed like it drive you crazy. Uh, Gibeon, uh, Jerusalem is over here. Gibeon is right there. So you look, it's not too far away. Uh, that's where the high place was, and Jerusalem was just a little bit down the road a little bit, a little bit south of that. He asked for wisdom. So what would you ask for today? Anybody anybody that would ask for something besides wisdom? If God were to, if God were to ask you what you wanted, has anybody got anything else they would want to ask for besides wisdom? Peace of mind. Wisdom and understanding. I don't know. Just peace of mind and and uh, and good health. 
Well, I, it, this this is a question. This next question is something that could be controversial, depending on where you come from, is if God still gives you those kind of choices today. And I believe I believe he does. Uh, our, I think our problem is waiting on the Lord to answer those things. Sometimes we get way far ahead of him. Uh, we want to want to do things on our own timetable and not necessarily um, wait on the Lord. I mean, that's the hardest thing to do. All right. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, you know. I don't know, Jim. I mean, I don't know. I have mixed feelings in that, but uh, that's my hope, you know. My hope well, is that. What are your mixed feelings? Just well, well, relying, you know, relying, uh, I guess, on on the God, on the Lord uh, for the things that you just said, you know. Yeah. I mean, knowing when to act, when not to act, you know, uh, you know, decide, just keep keeping the peace, you know, in my relationships with my wife and, and my family and friends and, and uh, you know, just feeling, feeling fulfilled, you uh, uh, in my daily living, and uh, you know, what what is that? What is it I'm being called to do? I feel like I'm called to do what I do professionally. I, I feel like I am called to do that. Okay, took me took me a while. Took me to about age forty to get to that point. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I understand I, that. And, and I can look back and say, okay, that's why I went through all that stress and trouble, and you know, uh, and and things that I went through to get me to this point. You know, in other yeah. words, yeah. So that's on a professional level, but on a personal level, I'm, 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 I'm just not sure. Uh, so it's kind of like, you know, we, as a parent, we struggle with, you know, what have I instructed, you know, my child and their daily living to do, you know, they're not certainly not following the path I took. Uh, and that's, that, that's good in a lot of ways. <laughs> There's a lot of positives with that, mm -hmm. but on a, on a faith walk, you know, it's kind of, I just have one daughter. So it's kind of like, all I can do is, you know, is hope that she has her own faith journey and ends up in the right place or a good place, whatever that, you know, wherever that is, you know, that's my hope. But, but I, I'm no longer in charge of her. She's well, you and I are in real similar positions that, you know, our, our backgrounds are almost exactly the same. Uh, professionally, and I think even our <laughs> our faith upbringing is kind of similar. Um, and and you've got to this point based on your own hard work, I guess. And 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 you, I, I think you may be the same as I in that you sometimes don't give the Lord credit for getting you where you are, just for giving you the gift of what's in your mind. And, and how strong your brain might be um you know that's something that yeah i guess i've been in some circumstances that sent me on this road on this uh path professionally i had a high school guidance counselor is one that sent me on uh on my professional path um my faith path was yeah you know, that's something that i yeah you know, i can look at and see people who led me in different directions and you know got me where i am and i think i see people in my path today you know even at 66 years old that are still guiding me uh, and, and there's multiple people doing that and and i think you know you and i and i'm not sure who else is on here paul and uh paul. and greg a few of them are up in close to the same age that those kind of things are becoming more and more important as our professional career, of course, Paul's professional career has been related to his faith all along. Um, but as we're reaching the end of our professional career, um, that the faith part of it is becoming more and more something we need to focus on. Now, I'm, it's me and Nick talking right now. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of where, where, where me and you are, I think. Uh, all right. The next one. This is uh, is this today's reading or is this yesterday? 
uh, it took him 13 year, years to build his own house and, and seven to build the, uh, the temple. And basically the same material, <laughs> kind of like uh, the forest, cedars from the forest of Lebanon, uh, all these details of, the, of his house. And I think the, uh, the, we haven't, didn't read as much about the temple, but I think they're pretty much the same things. Why do you think all these building details are listed? Um, uh, the picture there, uh, let me get out. Can y'all see my arrow? The, the, temple, yes, sir. the temple is this area right here. Uh, right now, there's a Muslim uh, Dome of the Rock there. That's, that's, they call it a mosque, but there's another mosque up here in this corner that's more important uh, to the Muslims. Saudi Arabia, if, if you paid any attention to what's going on, what has been going on the last six months, the Sunni Muslims have been moving toward peace with Israel. And the kingpin, and they're calling it the Abraham Accords, if you've heard anything about it developing, it was, uh, I think it was brokered by Jared Kushner, um, Donald Trump's son-in-law. He started this process of getting these Sunni nations to uh, to make peace with Israel, and there's maybe ten of them that have signed peace treaties. And the kingpin is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is where Mecca is, and most of the holy sites of Muslims of Islam are in Saudi Arabia, and um, they're Sunni. The Shiites, who are the more, I guess we'll call them from our viewpoint, the more violent uh, version of uh, Muslims. Um, the, the difference between the Shiites and the Sunnis, they all believe that their caliphate, uh, their Messiah, is going to be a descendant of, uh, let's see, I think they say he has to be a descendant of Muhammad, but... Uh, uh, the Shiites, I, I can't remember the difference. I used to know the difference. Maybe it's not that, maybe that's the difference. Maybe the Shiites say he has to be a descendant of Muhammad and the Sunnis are not so adamant about that. But uh, the, the, well, no, the yeah. I, I think they both believe that. But the Shiites believe that they have to usher, usher in the caliphate. They, yeah, what uh, is that? They're the but ones that are forcing out. Islam on everybody, and the Sunnis don't believe that. Yeah. Somebody else gonna say Too something? Bold. Yeah. Yeah. What? Define caliphate. What is caliphate? What is that? The caliphate is uh, okay. Let, from a Christian perspective, uh, the second coming of Christ would usher in, uh, uh, from a post-millennial viewpoint, the second coming of Christ would usher in a. Uh, millennial kingdom where Christ rules. Uh, millennial kingdom will be a thousand years. And then uh, after that, everlasting life in the eternal Jerusalem thing. The caliphate to, to Islam is something similar um, in that they, they have a prophecy from Muhammad that they will have a Messiah type figure that uh, ushers in this caliphate, that the entire world becomes Islam. So it's similar to what Christians believe. And the difference between the Sunnis and the Shiites is the Shiites believe that uh, that happens militarily, uh, that they have to take over the world. And there's, there's a similar movement in Christianity. Uh, there are, um, how, what do they call it, kingdom... I think kingdom theology or something like that, where uh, where the people that are in that movement um, believe that they have to spread Christianity to the whole world to usher in the kingdom. Uh, that that is a man-made thing, um, and the uh, the Shiites and the Sunnis have a similar uh, dis division. There's a stronger because they're the Shiites actually kill everybody that don't, don't agree with them, including the Sunnis. Uh, they they are going to insist that the Sunnis follow their way, or they'll kill them too. But and and that's why 
that's kind of why the Sunnis are uh, teaming up with Israel because they are not, they don't believe that they, uh, they take over the world militarily. They believe that their Allah figure is going to take care of that, whereas the Shiites believe that, that they're working for Allah. And that's why you hear all the all the Akbar and everything. So anyway, the what I was what got me started on that is the Dome of the Rock, where the original temple, most by most accounts, uh, was built. Um, this the Saudi Arabians say that's not true. That that's that, that well they what they say is that that spot is not important to Muslims. That is not the spot. What the Shiites say is that's where Muhammad mounted his heavenly steed and rode off into heaven. And the Sunnis say that's a bunch of malarkey. That that actually happened in Saudi Arabia. And the only reason that the the, the old mosque, the mosque that's a thousand years old, is over in this corner, and this mosque was built in uh, I think the 1700s during the Ottoman Empire. And the only reason they built it there is because the Palestinians wanted to keep the Jews out, that there was already uh, a movement for the Jews to want to move back to the Holy Land in the 1700s. So the Palestinians had the Ottoman Empire build that mosque on that spot uh, three or four hundred years ago uh, so that they couldn't build a temple there. But Saudi Arabia says that that's a pagan spot, that that doesn't, that doesn't, that's nothing important to them at all. So, and they're willing to give it up. So if the, the point is, if Saudi Arabia enters the Abraham Accords, they're saying, tear that mosque down. It doesn't mean anything. It's a pagan spot tear it down and, let, and they say that that's where the Jewish temple belongs um, which has all kinds of implication to Christian prophecy if that happens if that happens we better be out telling everybody to follow Jesus um, and maybe that's why all these details I mean that that might be why these details are here I didn't have a good answer when I wrote that um, and, and the last question they had was these things all this stuff fades away and certainly everything that Solomon built up here, she, you know, I was saying that's the temple, his palace was all these other buildings around here inside the walls. These, these are the walls. Uh, if you see, see these walls around here, those walls are still, well, they've been rebuilt. They were torn down, but they've been rebuilt. Uh, they were rebuilt in the 1700s. The Romans tore them down and uh, the Ottoman Empire put them back up. But City of David is this area over in here, and that's all being excavated right now. And it's, I mean, they're, they find things almost at least weekly. Something's found in there that uh, verifies that David was there. The sun's coming up over the trailer next door and getting in my eyes, not, not affecting my screen, but I sure can't see very well. Um, and it's too low for my awning to make any difference. So, uh, next one we get into, this is today's reading, if you've gotten to it, the Queen of Sheba comes and uh, she'd heard about Solomon and uh, what Corey was saying on the recap this morning, that was probably because of the trading ships uh, that they had been having trade with Israel. Sheba, I'll show in the next slide where it is, um, but it was not close. Um uh, but anyway, she came and uh, she said, Blessed be the Lord your God, who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness, which is what he had asked for. Um, so she gave, she gave credit to God because he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. She said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And uh, I wanted to talk about where it is. Jerusalem's up here. This is Israel at that time. And Sheba is down here in the corner. This is Saudi Arabia. It's basically this big area around in here. And Sheba was the southern tip of Saudi Arabia where the Red Sea goes into the, well, the, that wing of the Red Sea goes out. And it goes out into the uh, Pacific out further out that way. But it's, it's 1,200 miles from Sheba 
to Jerusalem. So she came a long way. And um, they, they hadn't encountered God's people. So she didn't know that much about, about Yahweh, the creator God. She just heard the stories of Solomon. And so how did God use Solomon? Solomon was used to spread the name of the Lord. That's my answer. Notice they don't have, they don't have questions on them. Uh, anybody have anything, any different ideas on any of that? Is that, is that something anybody else had ever wondered about? Because I didn't know these things, so I did the study for this last night. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Say that again. Anybody as far as how what she was? Well, who, who in the world is this Queen of Sheba? You know, it's. I want to know how she became queen in a man's world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, when I was, you know, I was looking for stuff to put in here. You know, so have you noticed sometimes they use pictures, sometimes they use maps, uh, different things. Um, the pictures they showed when I did a search for Queen of Sheba, most of them showed her looking African. And, you know, that may be true, but that area now is, it's, uh, you know, they're Arabs. I don't know if they were those kinds of people then or if they were Africans or what, but they showed her looking, looking like an African. Um, I don't know. You know, it's, uh, I don't know what you think it might she have had been. male concubines and lots of husbands. <laughs> well, I don't know. That's interesting. <laughs> Would that have been true? I don't know. You know, uh, typically uh, a queen was like the, the most popular or the most, the favorite wife, I guess I'd say it. If you, if you go back to Esther, uh, well, we haven't got to Esther yet, <laughs> But Esther was chosen as the uh, as a queen almost out of the lottery. Uh, they he didn't like his first queen. She rejected something he wanted to do. Basically, he wanted her to get up and dance in front of all his friends. Probably dance the way you would think he'd uh, God want his wife his wife to dance to be showing her off, and she wouldn't do it. So he kicked her out and picked another queen, and they picked her. Uh, after a year, they picked Queen Esther. So, you know, David, I guess they didn't talk about anybody being a queen with David, but he probably had his, his favorite was Bathsheba. Uh, you know that. He had a bunch of wives. and never did talk about who Solomon's favorite was out of those 700 wives. I don't know. And she, she may have been the royal daughter from somebody that became queen. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, sun's behind a cloud now. Uh, tomorrow's reading, which we haven't got to yet. Uh, get into a, a, there was a prophet that came against Jeroboam. Jeroboam was, uh, I think, the fourth king, sec second half. There was David, uh, Solomon, Rehoboam, and then Jeroboam and the kings were starting to get bad in this next chapter. They were not following God. They were going back to sacrificing at the high places, even after Solomon had built the temple and the kingdom was beginning to separate. And this, uh, this prophet came in and it were after Solomon. Now that's, that's starting tomorrow. Uh, this prophet came in and said that Josiah was going to be born and he would, uh, sacrifice the priest on the high places and the altar would split and pour out their ashes and Jeroboam wanted to get him arrested raised his hands, his hands withered uh, and then the altar split and the ashes poured out just like the guy prophesied so Jeroboam then kind of turned around and said why don't you come on home with me and we'll, we'll you know, get rested up and feed you and all that stuff and the guy said no not going to do it because God told me not to eat with you not to drink eat bread not to drink water or return the same way i came and went back a different way so that's tomorrow's reading uh, i'm gonna i got it highlighted here i went through it real quick you can read it tomorrow um, questions are and i can't see very good because the sun's getting real bright uh, so i just recounted what happened um, why does he not go with jeroboam because god told him not to and why do you think Jeroboam was against what he said? You know, my thought was he's not a godly king. He had bad advisors. This is the one when Rehoboam was, I think Rehoboam may have gone somewhere else. I can't remember exactly why, but uh, Jeroboam was 
his son and he was like a teenage rebel and he rejected the prophets, the old prophets and the old priest and took advice from his teenage friends. Uh, and he certainly wasn't a godly king and he had bad advisors. So I don't know, nobody probably, I don't know if anybody's read ahead on that yet or not. Um, that's tomorrow's reading. Hey, Jim? Yeah. Explain, to, was, was Josiah not walking in the way? Was Josiah? No, Josiah hadn't been born yet. If, if you go back, he, that was a prophecy. He, he, he's not there yet. He's not and God went to Judah. Uh, by the word of God, told Jeroboam, he uh, cried against the altar, and he said, Behold, the child Josiah by name shall be born to the house of David. He wasn't born yet. That, that comes up later. And, and they go back and forth between godly and ungodly kings God, for right. a long time. Yeah, I, I know that happens. Yeah, yeah, and and so that was that was a prophecy of what was to come. He wasn't born yet. And we'll get into that next week, I guess. Anything else on on the the lesson plan? So okay, let me get my share screen out and we just talk a little bit if you